Simon here with another installment of Remembering the Future, discussing the technology of the future that never was and things that might have been. In this video, I'll be talking about the Helmet TX turbine race car from 1968. Now, during the 1950s and 60s, there were many experimental efforts in the auto industry to develop turbine engine powered vehicles both for racing and ultimately for mass production for the public. The Helmet TX for Turbine Experimental had its origins in regulatory changes in sports car racing that took place in 1967 after auto racing sanctioning organization the International Automobile Federation or also known by its French abbreviation FIA uh, mandated smaller engines for cars in the sports car racing class for 183 cubic inches for sports prototypes and 305 cubic inches for GT class cars. This excluded many American race teams from international races since some of them entered cars with much larger engines as were common in US built race cars at the time. Inspired by Rover's turbine race car in the UK, and the STP Paxton turbo car in the US, as well as Chrysler's Ghia turbine passenger car during that period. American race driver Ray Pepinstall conceived of a turbine powered car that could compete in that racing class while staying within the new restrictions. Pepinstall initially took his proposal to the Allison Engine Company and to Williams Research, which were both manufacturers of turbine engines for aircraft, but both companies rejected his proposals. Pepinstall later approached fellow driver Todd Fleming with his plan. At that time, Fleming was vice president of the Halmet Company, a manufacturer of turbine engine components for the aerospace industry. Fleming was impressed, and he presented their idea of a turbine-powered race car to Halmet's board of directors. The board members realized that their sponsorship of a turbine race car would greatly improve the company's public visibility and agreed to lend their support to the project. engineering firm McKee Engineering was contracted to build two chassis. The cars were built to FIA's Group 6 sports car regulations. The design consisted of an aerodynamic body over an aluminum frame which was fitted with gullwing doors. The engine was a Continental Aviation TS-325-1 turbine that had initially been designed for a military helicopter that was ultimately cancelled. The engine had a maximum of 350 horsepower and generated 650 foot-pounds of torque at a maximum of 57,000 RPM. The engine's high torque negated the need for a conventional transmission. Instead, reduction gearing was used to send power to the rear wheels. The drive system had no reverse gear. Now, FIA regulations that cars have a reverse gear, so to comply with that requirement, a small electric motor that was powered by the turbine was installed in the cars. To compensate for the turbine engine's much slower th throttle response compared to that of a piston engine, a wastegate system was installed on the engine. A wastegate directs turbine exhaust away from the turbine, allowing the engine to be kept running at a higher power without having to throttle the engine itself. And use of the wastegate also compensated for the lack of engine braking by allowing the driver to cut the engine's power and decelerate safely without having to increase the engine's speed and thus avoiding acceleration lag when speeding up again. 
The first car minus the Continental engine was taken from the McKee facility in Palatine, Illinois to the Continental factory in Detroit for the installation of the engine. After the engine was installed, Hepenstahl and his team wanted to conduct a test run, but they didn't have access to the test tracks owned by the auto companies, and the only track in the De Detroit area that would have been available to them was unsuitable to them due to the morning's snowfall. Hepenstahl became impatient enough that he affixed a dealer's plate that he had with him to the car and drove it on the residential streets around the Continental factory until stopped by police and escorted back to the factory. The second car was built later and consisted of all original components. However, the first car was assembled from parts of a car McKee had built for another driver and had been returned to McKee as a trade-in for a newer car the company had built, along with other parts salvaged from other vehicles. FIA officials calculated that the turbine engine was equivalent to 180 uh, cubic inches and the car was certified to run in FIA's under 300 cc category of group 6. A special dispensation for the car to be fueled with, with a Jet A fuel, which is basically kerosene, was also allowed for. The car debuted at the 1968 24 Hours of Daytona race, with one car entered and the second car serving as a backup. The car competing in the race was driven by Ray Hepenstahl, Ed Lowther, and Richard Thompson, who qualified in seventh position and reached third place during the race. However, the wastegate malfunction causing the car to enter a corner with too much power and the driver lost control and crashed. Despite the loss, the car still garnered extensive interest and was even featured on the race's promotional poster. At the 12 hours of Sebring race, the car ran well during the first half of the race, but the engine was struck by debris and the resulting vibrations caused it sufficient damage to the engine mounts that the car was out of the race. The car qualified in sixth position in the BOAC 500 race at the Brands Hatch uh, race course in the United Kingdom, but the waste gate again proved problematic and a failure caused a crash after only running seven laps. The team remained in the UK for a one hour sprint race at the Olton Park course, and this time the car was driven by a British race driver named Hugh Dibley. However, a failure of the starter motor during the pit stop ended another attempt to complete a race. Helmet then shifted its attention from international races to Sports Car Club of America or SCCA races in the US and the cars finally met with success. Finishing second place at the Van de Graaff Trophy race in New Cumberland, West Virginia and setting a new lap record. The team was finally victorious at the Heart of Dixie race in Huntsville, Alabama, and later at the Marlboro 500 race in Trenton, New Jersey, the first time a turbine-powered car had won a race. Both cars were entered in the Watkins Glen race, and while one failed to finish after suffering a transmission failure, the other car finished the race in third place. At the Le Mans 24-hour race, however, both cars experienced mechanical problems and failed to finish the race. A major technical problem with the engine's operation was that it could not be shut down and immediately restarted while still hot. Regulations at the Le Mans race stated that engines had to be stopped during pit stops 
and the turbine engine in one of the cars was damaged by the crew's attempt to rapidly cool the engine by dumping ice water into the exhaust pipe. The second car ultimately lost the race due to time lost during a long pit stop to repair a broken hub. And yet again the cars were plagued by further technical problems with one of them crashing at Indianapolis after the troublesome wastegate malfunctioned and jammed open. Helmut decided after the Le Mans loss and the crash at Indianapolis, racing had become too costly and redirected the focus of their sponsorship on land speed records. One car was modified into a roadster, renamed the TX Mark II, and went on to set six speed records at Talladega in 1970. Despite the car's short racing career, it was, and still is, the only turbine-powered race car to win a race. Both cars have been restored to running condition, although one car was equipped with an Allison turbine engine due to the rarity of the original Continental engines. A third car was built by McKee Engineering, utilizing a spare chassis, however this car is non-functioning. In recent years, the two original cars have been run in vintage racing events. Now the reason why this didn't ultimately lead to more widespread development and use of turbine-powered uh, cars in racing uh, was due to several factors. The most important one uh, probably was simply the way auto racing was structured and still is today. Uh, the regulations by the sanctioning bodies are based on conventional piston engines and the extra work involved to figure out uh, dispensations for you know a one-off turbine car probably complicated things at the time uh, plus the turbine engines being more suited for aircraft and more rarer than automobile uh, piston engines probably led to spare parts being less readily available and completely different operating and maintenance requirements led to some of the trouble that they had with uh, these cars and races. Now the thing is that doesn't make any of this you know a bad idea basically. If this had gone far enough it probably would have led to more widespread use of turbine cars and racing and the other companies that were developing uh, turbine cars for uh, widespread use by the public, the technology was very promising, but those factors, uh, the technology at the time, probably made uh, materials not as available. The specialized uh, materials for a turbine engine and the more extreme operating conditions probably would, would have been more readily available in the ensuing years if the research and development had continued further, leading to the materials research to allow for better mass production of uh, the better heat resistant and uh, more mechanically durable uh, turbine engine parts along the lines of the, the work that was done over many, many years for piston engines. But all that said, uh, this was still a fascinating look at what could have been and what still might be someday the Helmet TX Turbine Experimental Race Car. That's it for now. Click on subscribe and check out the other videos I have. This is Simon with Remembering the Future. Well, that's it for now and thanks for watching. Check out other videos on this channel. Click on subscribe watch the future videos where we remember the future.